failures. Okay, I think most of you know that I'm Danny Webster from my microsystems. Uh, I'm one of the technical guys, uh, so it'd be nice to know. <laughs> I know there's been a few issues with the shipping and things. Um, so that's certainly been dealt with. I see boxes of it going through the uh, lab, which have been tested and shipped. So you should, for those of you that have ordered, uh, should receive or in fact to receive in the near future, hopefully. If you have any concerns, I can pass them on to our sales guys and they will follow that up for you. But anyway, hopefully more interesting stuff. So I think the title of my talk's changed. Um, first of all, my uh, last one will talk about uh, uh, applications, and uh, now it's about democratizing wireless innovation. So the talk stays the same, but the title is changed. So what are we going to uh, talk about? So I'm going to talk about why do we need software-defined radio, uh, what is a software-defined radio, and what we do it the other way around. Uh, what is LIME doing about software defined radio? And I've got a couple of uh, nice little demos to show you guys, uh, which were working when I came in, so hopefully they'll be working when I get to that part of the talk. Uh, I'll be talking about the computing requirements of software defined radio. So that not okay, we'll come. And uh, also what computer languages we use for software defined radio, because obviously software defined radio means software. And software means a language, and uh, so I'm going to explore that a little bit today. And then I'm going to talk about something I'm more familiar with, which is about radio links. And we're talking a tiny bit about link budget, just enough to inform you and not to terrify you, I hope. And then I'll be talking about bad neighbours. Uh, there is a very nice solution, so you don't need to go and get a shotgun or anything for your bad neighbours. And then I'll be talking about the LimeNet uh, um, set of products. Uh, I have very little information on that, so be patient with me on that. I was told I was going to be given these beautiful videos to show you. Uh, apparently they'll be on my desk on Monday. Uh, <laughs> so it's been that kind of weekend. Okay, so why do we need software-defined radio? Well, back in the 1940s and earlier, it was frightfully simple. There were three radio standards. There was Morse code, there was AM modulation for the BBC to uh, uh, send out their uh, radio um, uh, entertainment programs, and there was frequency shift key. It was wonderfully simple. And then some wonderful American guy, I think it was, uh, invented FM, and life became a little bit more complicated. But it was still relatively simple. And then uh, the US military invented SATNAV, which of course we're all extremely grateful for. And um, that led to the development of CDMA type systems. Uh, but since 1991, the European Union, the wonderful guys in, uh, in Europe, came out with a mobile uh, telephone specification for 2G uh, GSM uh, telephones. And then that kind of starting point, after that there was an avalanche of radio standards for uh, entertainment, for navigation, for data and for mobile communications. So in the good old days, you used to have a box for everything. So you had a box for your AM, you had a box for your FM, you had a box for your uh, uh, digital TV, you had a box for your digital satellite, and so I go on. And uh, I don't know about you, but my wife is a minimalist, and she absolutely detests all these boxes. So what she would like is a, uh, a single box that um, doesn't have any wires at all and that does everything. Um, and I think software-defined radio kind of gets us a little bit closer to uh, this desirable situation. So uh, we just buy a uh, computer with a... Uh, working now. Uh, they were bluffing before that. Okay. Um, so you, you buy this uh, software-defined radio card and uh, uh, then you don't need any other radio boxes. So you plug in your sat satellite TV system into it, your ordinary TV and so on. So the RTL dongle was the sort of forerunner of this where you plug in your digital TV into your computer. And then gradually, I think more and more 
that these systems will be absorbed into your computers and probably your telephones for that matter and your tablets. Okay, so the software-defined radio which you buy from Crowd Supply is only really a tiny part of the system uh, depending on how you uh, view the system. So on, you, on one hand you have all the RF parts which will be the antennas, the uh, amplifiers, uh, switches, uh, the filters and so on which you need to make your system work well. Then you have your low cost software defined radio module which you may buy from Crowd Supply or whoever else you want to buy them from. And then you have your home computer and then you have all this open source software which you can get your hands on these days and then you have your Wi-Fi or your Ethernet or your ADSL which then connects you to the big wide world and that entire system forms your software defined radio and this is an extremely powerful system so I, I hopefully I will convince you by the end of this this gives you a, a enormous power uh, to develop radio systems so the LIME uh, software defined radio is based on the LIME 7002 uh, chip uh, which is a complicated animal to put it mildly. Uh, the analog part has over a thousand control lines in it and then there's a digital block on top of it. So at first sight it may seem absolutely terrifying. Um, maybe the first three or four sites is absolutely terrifying but uh, gradually uh, it will um, becomes more simpler because you have a lot of defaults in your software uh, so you don't have to start from zero to run this chip you're actually just modifying something that's already working so I think that makes it quite an easy chip to use once you have that uh, infrastructure in place so what is the 7002? Well it's what's called a MIMO radio, so it has two sets of receivers and two sets of transmitters um, transmitting at the same transmit frequency and the same receive frequency but carrying different information. Um, believe me that's a good point to quit on the detail of MIMO. Uh, <laughs> um, for those of you that are interested in it there's all sorts of clever maths which makes it all work and it increases your uh, data throughput. Uh, the LIME chip is a relatively low power consumption device. Uh, it's about one watt of power. Um, obviously the more things you disable, the less power it draws, and obviously the more things you enable, the more power it draws. So one watt is an average figure. It's field programmable, and the best way to understand that is the idea of field programmable logic. In field programmable logic you have a series of blocks and then through software you load in the definition for those blocks. And uh, uh, field programmable radio is very similar. You have a set of blocks and the gain and the frequency ranges of each of those blocks is then defined by software for your particular radio application. Um, for those of you that are interested in the radio performance of our devices Typically we get minus 10 dBm modulated output signal, uh, noise figures around 2.5 dBs, uh, plateau phase noise is 90 dBc, uh, far out phase noise is about 158 dBc. So these are fairly uh, typical specs for software defined radios or at least the professional end of them. Uh, if you have an RTL dongle then you probably find the performance is a little bit down on this but it's still a useful device. Uh, our DACs and ADCs run at 640 and 160 megasamples per second, though of course everything's programmable so you can run them much slower if you wish to. As I say, this is just the analog part and then there's an equally terrifying digital part of the system which uh, contains all sorts of filters, uh, mixers and uh, decimation and interpolation uh, things to help you change the sample rates. So what this means is that you can run your DAC and ADC at a faster rate than your computer is talking to it. Uh, the advantage of that is you get the best performance out of your software defined radio with the minimal amount of um, samples which you have to generate in software to feed the radio or to uh, process from the radio. 
So that means you can use lower cost computing uh, resources on this and still get good results. So I think many of you have seen the crowd supply um, adverts for uh, these products. So some of these pictures will look very familiar to you. So let me get my pointer. Does it work? Yes. Right, so this is our Lime SDR. It's the first one we did. Uh, I think we sold about one and a half million dollars worth of these guys, uh, or about to, uh, whichever the shipping state is. Um, likewise, we have the Lime Mini here, which has sold something like six hundred thousand dollars worth. And uh, I see these things going through the lab now, so I believe they're shipping, and uh, people should be getting them. And then at the high end, we have the PCIe version of the software-defined radio. Um, some interesting differences between these guys. Uh, they're not the same thing in a different form factor. They're quite different. So, for example, this one here has two 7002. Uh, it was developed for the uh, digital pre-distortion guys for their power amplifiers. So that means you get more efficient uh, power amplifiers to um, send out your digital radio signals. But you can use it for other things. There's no reason why you have to use it for what we developed it for. That's the fun of software-defined radio. Uh, we make something, you can use it for something else. Um, this uh, software-defined radio, the main one, has a waveform playback option on it. Uh, whereas the Mini doesn't have the waveform playback option, and both of them run off of USB uh, connections. And some of the differences between them is that, uh, let me go back one, is that the main Lime SDR one is a full MIMO product, so it has two sets of transmit and receive ports which you can use at the same time and it has multiple of these so that you can use it on different bands and then you just use a RF switch to select the band that you're uh, interested in. Whereas the uh, mini one only has a single RF input and a single RF output. There's also another device which is in the small print of the crowd supply uh, advertisements is our 8001 device. And uh, basically this is a uh, analog up converter down converter which would take you from uh, 3.8 gigahertz and take you all the way up to about 12 gigahertz. So if you're serious about satellites or if you're serious about point to point radio links uh, then this is the device that you probably need to, to make it all work. Uh, our design guys also had fun making boxes for the SDRs and I think some of you may have seen again the adverts on the crowd supply. So there's all sorts of boxes there, different colours, different shapes, different materials, different connectors. So we kind of have um, a sort of two modes of operation at the moment. We ha are shipping the uh, software-defined radio products, and we're also developing our infrastructure-based products, which uh, includes the LimeNet, uh, which are, again are beginning to ship, I believe. Uh, see piles of computers scattered around in the lab, and some guys building them somewhere. So uh, again, those of you who ordered on those should see them eventually. Okay, so now we come to one of our first uh, demos, and with a bit of luck. So on the table here in front of me, there's a Lime SDR, and it's running at the moment. Uh, uh, feel free to stand up if you want to get a better look. Um, basically, I'm running a uh, transmit output through an attenuator back into the radio. And if I were to unscrew that, the signal on here would disappear. Uh, I can't because I'm holding a microphone <laughs> and uh, um, the signal would stop working. So what you're looking at here is a WCDMA signal. Um, does this work? Yes, yeah, just about. Um, and basically to transmit WCDMA you have to meet certain um, requirements on the uh, uh, level of interference you generate to your neighbours. So basically, 
your interference to your neighbours needs to be about 45, 50 dBs down. And if I use this little calculator tool here, which I forgot to set up, just need a decimal point. So you can see from this calculator here, we're achieving the 50 dBs that we require uh, to meet the WCDMA transmit uh, specifications. So this is really a, a professional radio. Uh, it's not a uh, hacked um, uh, TV uh, receiver. It's actually a, a, a proper femtocell radio system, which you can then use for other applications. It's been great work, that, uh, just to, to say, put into context, it's been great work, the, the, the work that's done on the RTL. You know, it's really sort of facilitated the open source development of things like GNU Radio and so on. So I, I have a huge amount of respect for everything that's been done with RTL. But uh, this is really a second generation software defined radio. And th there is a, a, a step performance difference between the two units. So if you're serious about software-defined radio, you will notice the difference. Uh, this is the uh, software that we use to control the uh, um, radio. It started out as a debug tool for the chip. So when we first got the chip back from manufacturing, uh, we wanted to know whether it worked or not. Um, we wanted to check all the settings work, so if we changed a bias setting, the current went down and so on. So it gives you control of absolutely everything that's on the chip. And it's been gradually extended over the years to include the other features on the boards. So there's one for the uh, um, phase lock loop, which you can lock to other signals. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, they're under modules now. Uh, and there's various other things which you can use for uh, the FPGA and so on. So let me give you a very simple example here. Um, where's the FFT viewer gone again? So at the moment we're displaying WCDMA. With just one button press, I've gone to a single sideband uh, radio, which is overloading here. So uh, that's easily dealt with. I just reduce the gain. So I go to the TRF and uh, go to the gain controls, let's take it down to here and now you see it's not overloading so you have a, a fantastic um, gain control range uh, in all the different parts of the system so if you wanted to change the IF gain in the receiver there's a, a control here which you can then change the gain and so on. So you can play around with all these different settings and really optimize your radio. And I think that the thing I like about this is that with the waveform playback you can actually do this live. So if I'm doing something for a customer I would start off with a waveform playback and then I would change the settings and get it to a state which I can then give it to the customer. Uh, to give them an example setting file to get them going for their application. Okay, so let's go back now to the uh, talk. And of course it's gone right back to the beginning, so bear with me. Right, so the next one is the digital audio one. Um, what we have here is a uh, camera uh, connected to a Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, it's not being recorded, so don't worry. And uh, there's a Lime SDR Mini connected to this. And it was developed by a radio amateur called Everest uh, Korsjord. And uh, he wrote a digital video um, coder for uh, the Raspberry Pi. And this is actually transmitting live a video signal which is going to this unit here, which you can see here. Um, I think I'll be brave and try and connect a HDMI monitor to it. Okay, I thought it might be. 
something like that. Hold up, hold up. Okay. This is an opportune time. What the? Oh dear. Right. We never got one. fashion way I hold it up <laughs> and you see it um, basically you can see there's a video image uh, down here you can see there's a waterfall diagram there and it takes about a, a minute to warm up um, but it's running live here so if I were to reset it it would go for a boot sequence and start up automatically so this could be a basis of a, a security camera or something like that or it could be part of your local TV station if you're in a remote village somewhere and you want digital TV in your village um, you know this is very low cost kit so uh. right so we're back to the Bronze Age again um, yes I do need the projector working for the next bit Uh, no, they're taking the box away. Yeah, the, the one that went to the wall, though, just straight in here. Yeah, I'm not sure that's going to reach, is it? Uh, the original uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that was very cool to take down your equipment halfway through your time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I shot myself in the foot on this one, haven't I? <laughs> I'm sure they'll cut this bit out on the, uh, uh, for the people at home. <laughs> he is coming back, isn't it? <laughs> okay, there'll be a short intermission. I didn't expect him to run off with the box. <laughs> Switched it all off, haven't they? Nope. Ah, we're back, we're back. Well, well done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back up and running again. Can I interrupt your thing again so you can. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, oh. sure. Do what you need to do. Someone came and went and took a cable, right? No, just the, the box was. Chelsea, Chelsea. Sorry about all of this. Hey, look, there's a leatherman here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's the zip ties have been cut. Oh, yes. 
expect, right? Not quite. Oh. <laughs> well then. It is. <laughs> Let me just escape from here a moment. Try again. Okay, here we go. We're back in business again. Ah, yes, um, just going back to the SDR stuff again, we have a series of web links in this presentation which go to all the various things that help you. So, for example, we have the Myriad RF reference to the uh, Lime Suite source. So, for those of you who want to build it from GitHub, you can uh, get it from there, or you can get it from the POFOS uh, guys. Uh, they bundle it for Windows. There's details of the existing board, so it goes through virtually chip by chip what's on each of these cards, so you can make use of these things. And uh, there's also a, um, a hardware where you can actually buy it from Crowd Supply. And of course, you can buy the chips themselves without the SDR if you wish to, and build your own products. And they're available through DigiKey and Richardson RFPD or something. And uh, in theory, there's something called Ubuntu Snap Store, but no one was talking to me about it when I was asking, what does it do? So <laughs> uh, I believe what the idea behind it is that as people develop applications for the uh, software-defined radio, in Ubuntu, you can just go to the Snap Store and download whatever you want it to do. Um, I don't think it's quite reached maturity yet, but I believe it will gradually get there. For those of you who are technically minded, uh, I have a rather nice uh, sat-nav one we did a couple of summers ago in Octave. So basically it used a large number of the analog and digital blocks of the 7002 to make the software uh, much more relaxed. Um, even so, it was a bit tough for Octave. It was taking something like half an hour to process a couple minutes of data. So. Uh, I think someone produced a, uh, a C version of that, which was much faster uh, in the end. But nevertheless, there's been quite a bit of interest in our products for navigation. Uh, because the radio is so configurable, you can optimize the settings on the Lime SDR to give you precision navigation products. So some of our customers are, are very excited by this and uh, are looking to do some further projects with us on that. Okay, so as I said, the heart of a software-defined radio is the uh, uh, computer that drives it. So it's brilliant having a professional quality SDR, but uh, the question is, is how rubbish can your computer be and you still do something useful? Um, and of course, as time goes by, uh, what we consider now to be a rubbish computer was absolutely beyond imagination 20 years ago. Um, so there's this progression of computer technology uh, as time goes by. So what we'll find is that software-defined radio is going to move lower and lower down the food chain uh, because the computers have improved so much. So let's put a bit of flesh on this now. So the question is really how much computing you need depends on what you're actually doing. So, as you saw, the digital TV example was running on a Raspberry Pi, which I would consider uh, as a below entry level desktop computer. Um, whereas something like 4G would require a, a much more sophisticated system with an i7 and lots of RAM if you want to hit the 20 megahertz LTE specs. The other thing that's changing is that USB 2 is extremely widely available now. Uh, USB 3 is increasingly becoming available. Uh, PCIe, I think, is fading a little bit. or it, In fact, fading is the wrong word. It's actually changing its form. So instead of being a classic PC with a set of slots in it, which you put your cards in it, it's actually increasingly becoming part of the motherboard. 
So PCIe probably isn't going to go away, but you won't recognize what it's becoming because it's going to become a self-contained uh, module. So the other thing is that many uh, what I would call entry-level computers now are actually quad-core. Uh, I was looking in the airport shops the, uh, yesterday and they're starting to sell telephones now with eight core uh, processors on them. So obviously these are going to become dirt cheap and then there's going to be dirt cheap hardware that's going to come out of that. So there's quite exciting days. And in the lab I tend to use an Intel Atom as a reality check. You know, this is a bottom line uh, Atom uh, modern Intel processor now. And the other day I was having a look at the microcontroller market and again this is changing wildly. So in the old days you had the 8051 families, the Atmos, the Pika chips and so on. Uh, indeed in actually in our chip we have a uh, 8051. Um, and gradually these are being um, replaced by 32-bit ARM processors. And not only are they ARM processors, they're ARM processors with the SIMD capability on them. So for now you're picking up for five dollars something like a 500 megahertz ARM processor with a uh, neon um, SIMD unit on it. And this is you know, the hobbyist end of uh, uh, computing now. So that the world is changing at a phenomenal rate and this is excellent news for software defined radio. Uh, uh, just a few comments on some of the uh, uh, high speed uh, facilities available on these processors. The single instruction multiple data um, processors are, are, are quite amazing, I think. Uh, you know, you get some quite substantial speed increases on them. Um, the difficulty is, is convincing your computer to actually use them. Uh, so. You can go about it the hard way and uh, basically write assembler for your C program to take advantage of these features. Or you can try and coerce your compiler to do it for you. And um, it kind of works most of the time, I think. <laughs> Um, it's not perfect yet, but hopefully in another five years uh, the compiler will just do this automatically for us. And uh, we'll get the speed advantages of this. Um, the other thing that's sort of kind of happening is the OpenCL architecture which allows you to use your GPU. Uh, I did have a play around with this earlier this year and yes it does work but um, unless you have a high-end graphics card it doesn't really give you um, the clout you need to speed up your, your uh, uh, LTE type systems. So let's go a little bit deeper. You know, there's probably something like 20, maybe 50 computer languages that are commonly available and uh, potentially they all could be used with software-defined radio. And uh, they all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. So let's just pull a few of these out of the hat. So things like C++, C and Fortran 95, uh, these are quite low level compiled languages so they're extremely fast and I'll give you some speed comparisons in a moment. Uh, whereas you have at the high end, you have things like Prolog, you have Lisp, which are sort of artificial intelligence languages. Um, it turns out these artificial intelligence languages are perhaps the most weakly developed of the computer languages. So the other languages are, are, are really sort of set up for things like sockets, uh, um, uh, pipes and so on, whereas the uh, artificial intelligent languages seem to be a, in a different time zone. Um, hopefully that will uh, change as the years go by and perhaps new artificial intelligence languages will emerge which are a bit less cumbersome than things like Lisp with all its brackets. Yeah, some of you used it, have you? <laughs> Um, the other great thing is that uh, many of these languages include vector maths which helps to speed up your calculation times. Um, I think Fortran is very nice um, that it has that built in and I think the later versions of C have that built in and so on. So there's all sorts of uh, useful things that are coming out there. 
So you really have quite a phenomenal choice. You know, is Python the right language for your application, or do you want to um, use C++ or Fortran? Or do you want to go for some of the newer languages, such as Julia or, or things like that? And there's all sorts of reasons for choosing which language is right for you. Um, I, I can't say uh, that if you choose this language, everything will be brilliant. Uh, each language has its obstacles and its advantages. So timing is perhaps one of the more serious ones. You know, how fast will it do your calculation on your $5 uh, microcontroller? Uh, or do you uh, need something a bit more primitive that's faster? So as you would expect, C, uh, C99 is the fastest language uh, for pretty much everything. I don't think there are many cases it was slower than anything else. Uh, Fortran 95 put up an amazing fight. Um, it was a very close second. And things like Python was generally doing okay, but there were certain tasks where it fell apart. Things like pseudorandom number generation, and things like uh, uh, digital filtering it struggled with. Uh, Octave was horrendous. Um, basically you coded as much of it into C as quickly as possible to get the speed back. But it was a fantastic tool for developing algorithms. So speed isn't everything. Uh, sometimes it's the ease of developing the algorithm that's the important feature. So things like MATLAB and Octave really come into their own in those situations. Uh, Julia is quite a recent language, so um, I don't think it's in a state where it's competing with the other languages at the moment, but it still has some surprises. I think on one of the tests, such as uh, despreading uh, for CDMA systems, it did actually amazingly well. Um, so as it matures as a language, uh, I'm sure it will put up quite a good fight with these other languages. So. I, I view this chart not as a thing to um, degrade other languages, but as something to spur the compiler writers and the interpreter writers to uh, further develop the products so that they, um, we, we have a wonderful choice of software languages for software-defined radio. Okay, so let's go back to radio now. Uh, I find software a bit scary at times. Uh, radio is even more scary, uh, but I'm okay with that. Um, let's suppose, for example, we want to develop a, a local DAB radio. You know, say, for example, you want DAB radio for your block, um, and you want your own radio station playing your DJ music or whatever you listen to, um, and you want to have some fun with your neighbours and your buddies up the road, and uh, you want your own radio. So, presumably, you met all the, soft, the licensing requirements where you live, uh, and they aren't going to jail you for this. Um, then it's actually quite a straightforward thing to actually do. You can get from a, a SDR radio by itself something in the order of a 300 meter range. So I think I need to get to the touchy bit first. Um, people love to have a single number for range. Uh, in fact, it's a probability. If you stick a tree in your garden, you're changing the probability. You, you stick a shed in your garden that gets in the way of the line of sight of the antennas, you're changing the probability of your reception. So it, it really is a house-to-house, -house, room room-to-room battle as to exactly what range you will achieve with your radio. So just as you, you did with FM, uh, you had to move it around to the right corner in the house so it would actually work. Uh, so it is with SDR. Um, to get the best performance, you need to put uh, a high antenna. So the higher you get your antenna, the better. So having an antenna here isn't going to cut it out there. Uh, you really want this antenna on the side of the building to, if you want to transmit uh, to your neighbours. So for each radio standard, there's a sensitivity number, which you can work out uh, through some clever maths. Uh, hopefully they give it to you. Um, most often they don't, and you have to guess it. Um, having worked it out the hard way myself. <laughs> um, so the idea is this sensitivity number is the minimum signal which your radio will work with for that particular radio standard. And it's different for Wi-Fi to digital audio to digital uh, television and so on. Each radio is different. 
So you get some amazing numbers for some of the mobile um, telephone signals and some pretty rubbish numbers for Wi-Fi. Um, so if you're reasonably close to um, this um, magic range number, then you might get away with an indoor antenna, um, or you might be able to get away with just sticking it in the window and it works just fine. If you're, say, three kilometers away and you're struggling to get the signal, then maybe you want to stick the antenna on top of a pole and maybe you want to get a directional antenna such as a Yagi array. And then you, you would actually be in the sort of last few percent of the houses that are getting that signal then. So here are some tables, I'm not expecting you to memorize them or do an exam on it or anything like that, but it includes most of the parameters for that, different radio signals. So you've got things like DAB, digital television, GSM, WCDMA, 4G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee. Um, there are other radio standards out there, but these are the more common ones, I think. And there's a number for sensitivity close to the bottom. And you also see there's a, uh, a margin there. Uh, in this case, it's 30 dBs. So this is a fairly safe estimate of distance. So you can see in the middle somewhere, there's a distance uh, row. And you can look up your radio standard and get a feel for how far you can transmit with just a raw software-defined radio without a power amplifier uh, and using a fairly standard antenna, such as the dipoles that come with it through crowd supply. If you're more cutting edge and you want to stick your antenna on a pole and things like that, and then this table here has a much smaller margin and will give you a, perhaps a better idea of what the end of the range is. So for things like uh, WCDMA 3G, this could be as far as 26 kilometers. So that's quite a range for uh, a little $100 radio. Okay, so now we get to the nice bit, bad neighbors. Um, obviously, as Americans, I'm sure you have your own ways of dealing with bad neighbors, but the, perhaps the easiest way is to buy a $1 saw filter. Uh, no death roll or anything like that's needed. Um, and you can all live in peace and harmony. <laughs> um, so basically, my idea of a bad neighbor is a TV station. Uh, we have uh, the BBC back in the UK, and uh, in London they have a 100 kilowatt transmitter. Uh, worse than that, they stick it on a huge antenna on top of a hill, and it blasts the daylights out of uh, most of London. Uh, so this is really bad news if you're doing your home SDR project. You really want to try and protect yourself against these outrageous television personalities who are uh, being these most outrageous neighbors to you. And of course, the other bad neighbor might actually be yourself. One of the worst um, offenders for interference will actually be your own transmitter. So. Um, for things like uh, radio, uh, um, mobile radios, you have these duplex filters which separate the transmitter and the receive from each other. So you can actually have very good sensitivity on your receiver while still transmitting at a fairly high power. And of course, if you trans deal with the most uh, sensitive of signals of all, such as uh, satellite signals for GPS, you're looking at something that's one femtowatts uh, compared to um, 100 kilowatts coming from the BBC. So that's a phenomenal dynamic range which you have to live with. And to really get the best results out of your software-defined radio, you do need to look at the RF filtering. Uh, just sticking one of these on it on the bench and expecting to get ultimate performance isn't going to get you there. Uh, so that's why when I presented the first diagram, I had the bit for the radio filters. Okay, finally, we're coming towards the end here. Uh, I think I'm just about on time. So this is the LimeNet uh, system. So they have this little tiny custom PC, which I think probably has an i7 in it, but I can't remember the specs offhand. There's so many versions of it in our labs. And there's two 4G phones there uh, operating a video call. And um, the guys in our lab have been testing these in the local fields. 
and they've been getting something like uh, 300 meter, one kilometer range um, with a relatively low antenna. So if you stick the antenna up a bit higher, uh, then you probably get a bit more coverage out of these. Um, so this is really is, if you want a village 4G system for your village and you don't want to pay the uh, 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 rental rates for the uh, uh, SIM card, you can go to LimeNet, uh, you pay for the infrastructure, uh, uh, it provides the, its own SIM cards I believe, and you can set up your own mobile system and you can start billing other people for using your uh, 4G infrastructure or you can get your family and kids to use 4G and not have to pay for it, um, depending on your viewpoint on life. So it's some nice stuff. So things like GSM, our, our friends at Osmocom have developed a uh, open source version of GSM, and for, with something like a Raspberry Pi, you can have eight uh, voice conversations going on simultaneously. Um, you know, this is a full radio system with the stack and things like that, and it will just plug into things like LimeNet, and you're, you're up and running. So if you're in dark as Africa somewhere, you have a solar-powered Raspberry Pi, uh, you've got a radio network. Uh, or if you're in one of the uh, outlying areas, uh, America's huge, I, I know, so you have a little farm, as, farm outside somewhere of the town and you want your own 4G system to talk to your uh, farm guys, then uh, this, this kind of thing uh, does it. Obviously, if you want the real stuff, then you go for 4G. Um, if you want something, I believe it would support something like 90 uh, simultaneous video calls. We haven't tried this in the lab, so uh, please don't quote me on this. But uh, that this is what we kind of feel it should be able to do. Uh, if not, I'm sure the open source guys will fix it eventually. So it's running on an i7, it's running Ubuntu 16.04, it's giving you 20 megahertz MIMO LTE. And as I say, they're getting something like a kilometer range out of this. The bad news is that it's pretty expensive. So I think Amerisoft and Quartus don't do this for the love of it, they do it for money. Uh, so buying a license off them is the painful bit. Whereas you go for the Osmocom guys, it's open source. So just to wind up, uh, to, to wrap up here, um, is the combination of second generation professional quality software defined radio, modern, low cost, low power, high speed, multi core, multi gigahertz, ARM, Intel, uh, SIMD processors, uh, a rich heritage of computer languages, uh, development in open source and commercial software is giving you local area broadcast capability. Um, it's giving you local area mobile communications and hopefully it will give us the single box radio uh, that we all want. So that's my talk, uh, ladies and gentlemen.